The next session is Building the New Space Economy, moderated by Ben Basley Walker, partner and at Global. Good, uh, good morning. Um, it's a pleasure to be here at the Global Aerospace Summit once again. Um, this morning's panel is looking at the future of the new space economy, uh, how it's being developed uh, in the Gulf region, and where we might start looking to see what's going to happen in the future. So we'll start off by just introducing our, our panelists for today uh, and um, asking them all one key question. Uh, sorry. Um, which is, for you, what is the greatest challenge you see in the space economy going forward? Um, and then we'll talk a little bit about how the new space economy fits into that. So, George, uh, George Whiteside, CEO of Virgin Galactic, can you kick off? Yeah. Um, so, uh, nice to be with you all and, and appreciate the opportunity. I think, um, you know, there are a lot of key issues facing the global space community, um, but I think one of the key ones when you look at the combination between commercial space and, and government space is, is really space debris and space traffic management, particularly in a future where there are, you know, proliferated multi-thousand uh, unit uh, constellations getting launched. Um, that is an exciting future, and it is one that enables a lot of new capabilities for humanity, a lot of new benefits uh, for Earth, but one in which we really have to make sure that we have the systems and processes in place for sustainable uh, space utilization um, and, and don't have uh, some kind of proliferated um, space debris problem. So that would be one um, key issue that I think we need to face together as a community. Thanks, George. Um, Talal Kaisi, Vice President of Space Programs Special Projects at Group 42. Uh, Talal, where do you see uh, the biggest challenges of the space economy in, from where we stand today? Thanks, Ben. Thanks, and uh, good to see everyone here again. Uh, I just recently, as you know, moved from the UAE Space Agency to G42, so there's a lot of people that probably don't know what G42 is, so hopefully that'll come out in the discussion. But to answer your question, uh, I think everything George mentioned is absolutely on point uh, in terms of how I see it, but uh, I would add to, to that maybe an opportunity that um, if, if it doesn't uh, materialize becomes a challenge, and that's uh, adjacent industry stakeholder engagement and, and trying to ensure that we get as much uh, people vested in space from different industries, the energy sector, the uh, healthcare sector, and especially at a time like this where we're going through a pandemic where priorities with national governments are, uh, from a budgetary standpoint, you know, kind of diverted to that domain, um, we, sh we still should, uh, you know, try to emphasize to governments the importance of spending on space for two reasons. One being, you know, there are some natural ancillary ben benefits to the healthcare domain that, that come out of space. And we've seen many of those examples in the past. Uh, but more importantly, you know, we're in the business of manufacturing hope and inspiration in the space domain. And you have to invest in that to, to get that type of a return. And sometimes it's, uh, it's hard to quantify that type of a return, but it's very tangible when you look at the um, uh, uh, results of that inspiration value. We recently launched the HOPE mission. Uh, and, and I think it's, uh, it's um, you know, even with our human spaceflight program, you see a tangible results in terms of the inspiration value and hope that that presents. And at this point in time, you really need a lot more of that. So this is the time to double down on investing in space, but it's up to us as part of the space community to articulate that to governments and ensure that those uh, investments are being made. Thank you, Talal. Um, Dimitri Lotsov, uh, Vice uh, um, Director General of Glav Cosmos. Uh, Dimitri, as um, an established space player, um, how do you see this period of transition and, and what do you see as the, the biggest change and challenge for you um, in the new space economy? Well, thank you very much, uh, Ben. Hello to your colleagues. For, for the Russian space industry, I would argue we need more uh, governmental role, but not as a, you know, as, as a uh, government, as an enabler of the uh, private space business. We need a clear government policy. We need uh, straightforward rules and regulations. We need some guarantees for private investors. And uh, you know that uh, probably, you probably know that in my country uh, in the 90s, the period of privatization of, of state assets uh, was, was uh, benef beneficial more for private uh, interest rather than for public interest. And that, that is uh, 
a matter of concern as well today. So we need clear governmental policy. It's, it's the new space and the government conservative space are not contradictory to each other. They're just two sides of, of the same coin. And that is why the, the role of the government should be enabling and, and helping hand. Thank you, Dimitri. Uh, Adnan al Rais, uh, Senior Director for the Remote Sensing Department of Mohammed bin Rashid uh, Space Center in, in Dubai. Um, Adnan, obviously, um, and I'm not sure we can call the UAE a new space sector anymore. You are making kind of leaps and leaps and bounds forward. So as you kind of have found your place within the, the new space economy, um, what has been the biggest challenge that you've kind of seen or, or you, you feel like you guys have faced um, as you've continued to kind of make inroads in the, in the sector? So when it comes to the uh, new space economy, um, uh, in the UAE, as you know, we have uh, a sustainable program here. And we have a clear program that comes with the National Space Program, which consists of the Satellite Development Program, Human Space Flight, uh, Mars Exploration, and also our long-term vision when it comes to the Mars 2117. I think for, for any you know, establishment, for any new companies and startups looking for doing business in space, uh, when they enter a market, they need to make sure that they, uh, there's a clear plan in, the, in that market and also there are opportunities in the market. And this is, uh, you know, a, a challenge that uh, uh, might face some of the companies in entering certain markets. Uh, another thing is, as I mentioned earlier, is the regulation. Uh, the space regulations nowadays uh, should uh, adopt, you know, the, the newcomers into the space uh, sector. And those comers coming, those new companies coming from uh, uh, maybe from different sectors. So the regulations. Uh, should uh, be eased so that we can include uh, the new uh, companies and the new startups. Uh, in addition to that, another important point is the standardization. Uh, this is something that uh, we're kind of lacking uh, in the space sector. If you compare the standardization in other sectors when it comes to the IT, uh, aviations, uh, and other sectors. So the cycle of development, for example, a single spacecraft that takes a couple of years, and during those years you have a lot of new developments and new things coming up. So by that time you're launching your, your satellite and your, your mission, you're basically launching something that is like three, four, five years old, while today you have you know, much more advanced technologies. So I think it's the, uh, the standardization is a key, is something that also uh, the new space uh, economy is facing. Uh, we need to work hard on developing the standardization to make sure that uh, we can develop uh, space systems, uh, uh, you know, uh, and cope with the advancement uh, and the technologies, uh, you know, when we are developing those missions and launching them to space. Thank you, Adnan. Um, Luigi Scatia, um, managing partner at PwC, uh, focused on space. Luigi, you've had a finger in many pies, both commercial and government, um, in looking at how you can support countries and, and companies to participate in the future economy of space, uh, including the UAE. How do you, what have you seen as kind of the biggest challenge across the board for, for those kinds of companies and countries that, that you see is going to be the biggest hurdle in the future? Well, I mean, I mean thanks a lot, uh, Ben, for the introduction. Um, well, I, I just want to echo uh, some of the comments that were made by my fellow panelists. Uh, I mean, they've, uh, they've raised excellent points from an uh, operational uh, standpoint and from uh, uh, funding, uh, uh, investment standpoint at government level. I just want to follow up to that and say that I think one key um, issue that needs to be addressed in order to uh, fully realize the potential of uh, uh, space economy in any given country is uh, the issue of the governance. So I think there is a need to uh, sort of uh, uh, surpass uh, the, the model, the classic governance model uh, uh, that we have uh, nowadays with space agencies and transition into a more distributed model where uh, um, space is more embedded into other, uh, into other parts of governments and into other parts of public policy in a more structured fashion. So this is uh, it's, it's quite important when you consider the, the reach and uh, um, and the enabling uh, uh, factor that space has uh, with multiple other sectors and multiple multiple other parts of the economy, and it's quite important 
to have uh, this type of uh, sort of distributed governance in order to uh, always fully convey the importance of space in any given non-space verticals and to avoid the uh, issues that were meant like the one mentioned by Talal on uh, uh, budget cuts when there are uh, uh, there are a period of crisis uh, or crunches like uh, like the one we are uh, living today so it's I mean this is one of the parts I mean many other uh, aspects were, were already mentioned but I think the governance aspect will play uh, should will play a big role in the future thank you Luigi Gregory Pedersen, Regional Sales Director for Space for Airbus uh, Defence and Space. Uh, Gregory, Airbus is a, a company with a long traditional history um, and, and a long legacy in this sector. Um, as you've continued to kind of innovate, what has been the, the challenge that you've seen at most pertinent to address um, as you kind of tackle the next phase of the space economy? Well, I try not to repeat too much what has been said before. Uh, first, maybe good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to all the audience uh, that is with us. As we are virtual, uh, virtually, we are all uh, the time of the day and of the night. So, um, uh, one of the challenge, or let's let's say, to continue to reap the benefits on Earth of all the space initiatives, and uh, is is really to for us uh, to make sure that space remains sustainable. Uh, when I say this, is that. Uh, we have the mega constellations today. We have many additional programs, many satellites, many debris. So I think it is our responsibility as, as a space community uh, to continue to ensure that we can uh, have this use of space without any conflict, without any uh, threats from debris. And we need for this, I think, to reinforce uh, the space law, uh, to deal with the space debris, and also to continue implementing uh, space traffic management and space institutional awareness uh, solutions. So we can make sure that we will continue with space and continue with all of our ventures and reap all these benefits for, for the users. Thank you, Gregory. I mean, certainly um, I'd like to pick up with Talal here. Talal with a, a you know, very unique experience having just left government and joined uh, a highly innovative company in the private sector. Um, for you, what is the, the balance of, of how companies are being most effectively enabled within the UAE or, or indeed more globally um, to be successful in, in the new space economy? Yeah, so I think um, something that Adnan touched on was extremely important. The uh, regulatory uh, environment have to, has to be conducive and incentivizing. And I guess that's um, some of the uh, most important uh, elements of what we worked on when I was at the space agency, uh, ensuring that there was an enabling environment. And, uh, you know, I'm very proud that in a, such a short period of time, we have a space law, we have a, a space regulatory framework, a policy and uh, uh, you know, a strategy that's very, very um, ambitious, aspirational, and has a future-oriented type of uh, uh, touch to it with certain activities that provide the certainty that investors and companies need. Um, you know, as Dimitri mentioned, it's, it's, it's extremely important to have that investor confidence and that investor certainty. So that's one angle. Now, in terms of other ways that this could be uh, supported, I think, um, again, with adjacent industries, like the, the reason I took this, um, what some people might think of as a leap of faith, but I, I called it a jump of confidence into the private sector is because I, I, I think we need more people that are domain experts in space that go out to the private sector that can help um, uh, move the needle on some of these things to ensure a sustainable uh, program. And, and effectively in, in a company like G42, you know, we're a holding based company here in Abu Dhabi that has several different operating companies and different disciplines of AI practice. And space is li literally the ultimate use case for AI and, and can um, we, AI can power so much when it comes to some of the issues that we just mentioned over here with space traffic management, SSA, uh, robotics, autonomous operations. So if you look at mining operations and um, uh, uh, terrestrially, a lot of that has to do uh, with remote and autonomous um, uh, systems and robotics. So, so the, the AI power behind those types of things could be leveraged in that sense. And it's similar with other industries and capabilities in those other industries that could be translated into space, including um, the energy sector and the healthcare sector and vice versa. So I think those are the types of things that, um, you know, we can work on together hand in hand between the private sector and the government to ensure that we progress. 
Thank you, Talal. Um, George, perhaps as a, as a company that was very much at the, at the forefront of a certain flavour of the new space economy, um, what do you see has been the thing that's enabled you the most? Um, and working with kind of the traditional space community, um, what has been lessons that you would repeat and hurdles that, that you would rather avoid? Um, if you were giving advice to people who are slightly further down the, the process in, the, in, the, the, in their process in building their role in the new space economy? Well, Ben, the easiest answer to your question is, is of course, that, you know, with all these enterprises, capital is crucial, right? And uh, in the space world, um, capital is, is possibly even more important than it is in other, in other sectors, just given the scale and the scope of some of the ventures that we launch into. I think one of the great exciting parts about the, uh, this moment in the space community is that ventures um, are, new ventures are able to be done in space for less capital than in the past. And, and that's largely due to small satellites and other uh, innovations, which is really exciting. What I would actually highlight though, is something that um, Talal was sort of referencing, which was the regulatory framework. So uh, in 2004, the US Congress passed something called the Commercial Space Launch Amendments Act. And um, that really set the stage for the next phase of human spaceflight, commercial spaceflight in the United States. And then that was amended in 2010. But what it did was that it set out a sort of a, a forward thinking regime, which enabled companies to think reasonably about putting humans into space on a commercial uh, vehicle. And it, and it made it possible uh, to do that. And, and I think, you know, the UAE should be congratulated for essentially establishing, you know, a similarly positive and encouraging regulatory regime because that was that was crucial and then that then enabled the investment of you know frankly billions of dollars of uh, of, of private capital uh, which then generated um, you know at least thousands of jobs and um, and and so I think that 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 marrying up you know um, intelligent capital which sees great market opportunities uh, and, and and leveraging that capital so that it keeps coming into the industry along with a smart regulatory framework um, that appropriately manages risk, um, I think are two crucial ingredients for you know, continued growth and continued economic uh, growth with, with the jobs that come along with it. Thank you, George. Gregory, in terms of, of Airbus, you know, how are you viewing um, the new space and, and what new space sector and new space economy and what does that mean to you as a as an incredibly large uh, aerospace player. Sorry. Yeah, um, it's true that we've been involved in space for uh, for some time, let's say, and, and that we launched our first satellite some, some time ago. But at the same time, I really feel that that uh, we are fully part of the of the new space economy, and that we are a real uh, full actor of this new space. Uh, this said, of course, uh, the emergence of new space has given us on, on traditional industry or legacy industry, a good push uh, in order to uh, to challenge us to be uh, to be faster, to be more flexible, uh, and also to be more daring. You know, uh, these new ventures they, they take risk, and uh, maybe some uh, some actors uh, were relying too much on on, on the, uh, governmental uh, contracts and on, on are not taking risk uh, or not daring anymore to 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 innovate too much. Um, new space is is also enabling an extension of the space industry. And, and to, to this extent, competition is good. Uh, it, it makes all, us all better on the market. It makes us serve much better our customers. And it makes us innovate even, even more. And luckily, innovation is not uh, a reserve or limited to new space. Uh, all, all space actors uh, are, are innovating. And uh, uh, so we've been creating, our new space has been creating significant number of, of new opportunities. And for us, partnering with this new space um, ventures uh, being involved in constellations that are one way has enabled us also to review and reassess uh, all of our manufacturing process and be more efficient on, on bring uh, better services and better products uh, to our customer. We introduce automation, design to cost, design to manufacture, many uh, new innovation in terms of uh, uh, productivity and production that is for the benefit of all our programs and all our products. Thank you. Dimitri, given the, the reality of the new space economy that we find ourselves in, which is highly global, um, from a, a Glav Cosmos perspective, how are you facilitating um, new space economy players within 
uh, Russia to participate in that in that global economy? And and what are you seeing as the your role as as helping them most effectively participate? Yes, thank you, Ben. A very good question. Um, as someone who has been working in the Russian government for six years, I know how the, the bureaucracy is working, and and this is how we are helping our space companies uh, to, 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 to do business. We just know whom to call and where to go. This is just one example. Uh, but uh, for traditional bureaucracy to do something, to, to do more while, uh, uh, while spending less is, is something unthinkable. I mean, it, it's nonsense. Uh, so that is why when I was going into this uh, space business, I could not imagine that there are some Russian private space companies, but they do exist. I mean, I mean, there are three uh, sorts of uh, uh, companies in, in uh, Russia, space companies. One is uh, the Roscosmos, it's a state company, Roscosmos, Gazprom Space Systems, Russian uh, satellite uh, uh, systems. There are also private-public partnerships, such as GK Launch Services, uh, Gornets, Asmerit, and there are private companies, purely private companies like S7 Space, Cosmocores, Sputnik, Scanex, and some other. There is also a certain category uh, of a company which which like makes a kaboom during a fire test and you know goes on a world tour with a cool video, but we we're not talking about them today. Uh, so GK Launch, for example, uh, uh, this is our daughter company of Love Cosmos. Yes, and our UAE friends know them very well. Uh, they uh, the uh, one fourth, twenty five percent of the capital is a private capital, is a private investor. And uh, as a chairman of the BOD of that company, I'm, I'm, I know what challenges they're facing. And I'm trying, once again, I'm getting back to, to what, where I started from, to remove administrative barriers as, as much as possible. Unfortunately, sometimes for the private business, uh, we have this sort of uh, uh, presumption of, uh, of guilt, not presumption of innocence. And uh, and we need the change of philosophy, at least at least in my in, in my view and, and uh, in in our region. So the bottom line is uh, we we still need political support from the top. Uh, for example, the, the Russian space industry is not just just Roscosmos. Roscosmos builds ground infrastructure, satellites, uh, launch services, but but it's just a small fraction of the space business. Uh, nearly a, a huge part it belongs to other agencies and businesses like Gazprom. Uh, space systems, uh, Russian satellite communications company is uh, under Ministry of uh, of Communications, which was recently re renamed into Ministry of uh, Digital Development, uh, Communications and Mass Media. But uh, but you need to really know, I mean, how the system works in Russia, for example, in order to to build a successful business. And uh, my advice to to a startup or to a private company at an early stage uh, would be not to plunge into competition with established uh, state companies. It can be good at a later stage. Uh, competition, competition is always good. I mean, I really understood it when I uh, started to, uh, to, to do business myself in the, in the space area. So we are just trying to offer some synergy between state uh, private goals and state goals. Thank you. Thank you, Dimitri. Adnan, um, obviously the UAE uh, was a little later to the party than um, the Russian Federation on space. So you had the ability to kind of pick and choose where you sat in the global value chain and, and which issues you choose to take on. Um, if you're looking for um, an increase or an engagement in the new space economy, how do you balance um, participating in that global value chain with developing indigenous programs and indigenous skills that are really focused on, on national objectives? So it has been always this balance between our national objectives as well as our contribution internationally. So when we started back in 2006, uh, we focused at the beginning of the development of the local capability through the know-how transfer programs where we develop those skills and the talents and the we we founded this uh, uh, a strong foundation of engineers which they developed uh, advanced space systems this allowed us to expand internationally and engage in larger pro projects uh, and our catalyst project was the emirates mars mission 
which we partner with our colleagues in the United States and developed uh, the Emirates Mars mission, which we launched successfully last July. And this is our contribution internationally uh, as an important mission that will contribute to, with the global exploration roadmap and provide uh, passive knowledge. So it is always this balance. So we have our national objectives. However, at the same time, we are contributing internationally. Also, when it comes with the other programs we have, like the Mars 2117, it's a 100 years of strategy. We have our, uh, our own national interest when it comes to the food, water, and energy security. Those are the challenges that we, uh, we're going to face uh, on Mars, but also those challenges we are facing it here today on Earth, in our region, in our country. So this, there's those balances. Uh, at, this, at the same time, we are solving an issue here on Earth. At the same time, we are also contributing on the implementation of the global exploration uh, roadmap. So the same applies with all programs and products that we have. When it comes to the human space flight program, we launched our first astronaut international space station, and now they are being trained uh, with our colleagues at NASA for the for long duration uh, mission. So we're developing our local capabilities, but also we're trying to be a very active uh, contributor when it comes to the uh, human space flight uh, programs. So we have all of this uh, balance and we're going to continue doing that, uh, focusing on the, uh, uh, our national interests, but also working collaboratively with the, inter with the international community. And international collaboration it has been you know, an integral part in all of our programs and all of our uh, projects. Uh, we work with our colleagues in South Korea and our know-how transfer program. Uh, and we, we work with our colleagues in Russia and launching our first astronaut and launching our satellites and missions. We work with our colleagues in NASA and the United States on the development of our Mars mission. So uh, international collaboration is an integral element in all of our programs and all of our projects. And we're gonna continue doing that. Thanks, Anand. Luigi, given you are perhaps the most conceptual uh, uh, thinker in our panel today on, on the space economy, um, for you, we're talking about a, a concept which is, is a bit of an elephant. Everybody takes a different part of it and sees it a little bit differently. For you, how are you conceptually defining that from the economic uh, perspective? Um, and when building a, a new space economy, what are you seeing as kind of the key economic drivers that are, are the things that are defining success from failure? Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, that's, uh, that's an interesting question indeed. Um, I, mean, I guess if we really go at the core of uh, what new space means and uh, what new space has represented uh, so far for the sector, I guess we can say that new space has represented um, like a paradigm shift in the way, uh, let's say, uh, space asset development and operations is carried out. So there's been a, a sort of a shift from something that was government led and government owned to something which is industry led and industry, industry owned with a shift in risk taking uh, uh, commensurably. Um, but uh, on the other end, uh, I don't think there has been a, a substantial paradigm shift in terms of market and demand. Because in the end, if we look at the, 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 the current, uh, I mean, the way the, the market operates from, uh, from the demand perspective, uh, we still have the government as a major uh, customer everywhere. And we still have, um, I mean, yes, we have uh, evolving applications. We have an increase in certain uh, demand for certain applications, but we haven't really seen this explosion of new uh, applications or uh, new uh, uh, use cases of new type of customers that uh, is usually associated with uh, uh, the, the new space narrative, if you want. So if we take uh, the, the, the way like, uh, you know, new private launchers have been developed, yes, in a very innovative way uh, with a very efficient uh, utilization of, uh, of uh, resources and everything. But then if we look at how, I mean, the launcher industry operates, it's more or less the same as before. And uh, the, the customers of SpaceX are the same customers <laughs> that before were of uh, ULA and so on. So, uh, DOD, a lot of governments and so on, and the usual, uh, you know, commercial market. Uh, so 
I think what we really need to see a, a real new space paradigm shift that also involves like the, the creation of new demand is uh, to, to really see that we really need to bridge this gap in uh, um, in the reach of space into new uh, into other sectors and uh, uh, this is something that industry can do the industry can push for um, and for sure i mean uh, there is a role for the industry to play there and there is an equal role from the governments to also uh, accompany this process with appropriate policies and uh, uh, with an appropriate uh, um, awareness as well within the government itself, because it's not always uh, there, basically, and it's not always well understood that, uh, at government level. So from my perspective, yes, new space is a, it's beautiful, it's a fantastic thing, because indeed you have stuff carried out uh, uh, more easily, with less money, and uh, uh, you, can, uh, you can definitely say more efficiently, Yes, there have been some new markets created. So for sure, I mean, if we think about uh, uh, you know, space tourism, it's clearly something new. It's clearly something very exciting and everything. But especially when I think at all the uh, possibilities that are marketed in terms of new space applications and what they can bring to the broader and wider economy, I think we are progressing in, uh, in an evolutionary fashion, not really in a revolutionary fashion. And for that revolution, there is uh, maybe a need of something more structural happening uh, in the fabric of the sector. Thank you, Luigi. Talal, um, perhaps to kind of uh, be a little bit seditious, um, would you agree that maybe the term space, new space economy is, is potentially no longer valid? Um, because a company like G42, which has fingers in, in lots, of different system, lots of different issues, which have a space component. So should we um, decentralize the space economy and start just including it in all of these different areas? Maybe you can touch a little bit on, you know, how you're seeing space in, in all the different areas that G42 is working in. Yeah, that's a, that's a good question. I don't, I don't know the answer yet. I'm trying to work on figuring out exactly how we're going to structure a space vertical here, but maybe I can take a step back and uh, give people insight on what G42 is, because it's a fairly um, new company relatively. I mean, it's about two years old, but it's done quite a bit in those two years, and it's actually on the front lines right now uh, fighting the pandemic with its AI solutions and, and the capabilities that it brings to the table when it comes to testing and uh, contact tracing and uh, vaccine as well. We're leading the the effort on, on the vaccine front. So it's it's pretty robust in terms of uh, an offering and capability and how it leverages AI. But to take a step back, I mean, um, it's basically an AI and cloud computing company that's dedicated to the development and implementation of holistic types of um, solutions, uh, scalable technology solutions. And the, the, the key, the mission is to help our UAE government uh, deliver on the long-term AI vision and AI agenda. So, uh, you know, we have an experienced team of many data scientists, I think hundreds of data scientists that are working on both the fundamental and applied AI research uh, and uh, several different verticals, as you mentioned, that we operate in from smart cities to healthcare, as I mentioned, uh, financial services is another big one. Uh, and then energy, the energy space is one that we're really um, uh, trying to help right now with AI type solutions uh, as well. So I'm, you know, it, it's obvious that space is a natural evolution and a next step and a great use case for a AI as well. Now, um, we've kind of transformed in these two years from an analytics company or a very analytics heavy company to a more cognitive company and what that means is if you look back to when uh, when we started uh, initially we were focused on structuring like massive amounts of data that were coming from government and industry clients uh, trying to ingest organize and correlate all that data which kind of birthed the data center cloud and compute infrastructure that we have uh, so think of data as analogous to food uh, it feeds the muscle of which uh, is our data center and our uh, artemis supercomputer yes it's called artemis uh, which is very interesting i only found that out recently but um, uh, but this supercomputer is like one of the top in the world and is it's it's got great capabilities um, the second pillar is our cloud orchestration layer and this puts all the muscle that i just talked about to work it provides kind of the platform and our ability to make sense of all that data and ensure that they're in synchronicity with one another uh, so that the cloud so the cloud if essentially links all the muscle so it's kind of analogous to you would say tissue and bones in the human body 
And then the final pillar is our fundamental AI, AI research institute that I mentioned earlier. And we have, it's called the Inception Institute of Artificial Intelligence and houses hundreds of data scientists. And it's become one of the most published AI research organizations in the region and one of the largest globally. And so this is analogous to the brain. So you see where I'm going with this. You can put all this together and you can, and this helps feed into our AI national um, UAE program and um, prepares us for a world that's transforming between artificial narrow intelligence to artificial general intelligence. And the best use case of all this is um, either going into the molecular level, very, very small, and, and processing that data, data for our human genome pro program, or with space which is, um, you know, when you look at it um, in, in, in light years, you're looking at 10 to the positive 12 and 10 to the minus 12 and AI being in the middle, the engine that powers all that. So maybe uh, a digital astronaut is in order, but until then, you know, geospatial analytics, uh, SSA, STM, autonomous and ro robotic operations, like I mentioned, those are the things that I think we would look at as the low hanging fruit to help terrestrial industries, as Adnan put it, energy, water, and food, and translate that into uh, space applications as well, and vice versa. Um, would you also say, Talal, that, that there's the part of your business that might also just consider um, the space to not be sexy anymore. It's just another data source. Um, so it just happens to be, a, you know, another feed, um, yeah. your process, which is starting to hit in, in, in lots of different industries um, across the board. I, I would definitely agree with that. Although I would just say that we will make it sexy no matter what. So don't worry <laughs> about that. <laughs> Thank you, Talal. Gregory, uh, when you're looking at a company's biggest Airbus, um, the, the new space of economy has a, a proliferation of small players who are either doing very, very niche things, um, the, the kind of larger companies that are, are kind of trying to, to put together the suite of capabilities that, that Airbus has are a little bit different. How have you found the best way to collaborate or engage with um, smaller players that are coming up because of this new space economy wave? Um, in your larger kind of traditional traditional business, yeah, it's true. New space is uh, is small, is fast, is uh, scalable, and re recognize that traditionally uh, Airbus is not uh, necessarily all, all of that. Uh, but uh, we are good at uh, innovating, and I think we are a fantastic partner uh, for uh, small companies, either as an investor, a supplier. Or, or partner. So we have found ways to also be small, uh, be fast and be scalable in order to make sure that the new space market progresses within Airbus and also wherever else people wanted uh, to innovate. Uh, we have launched on ADAPT and launched many uh, different initiatives. Uh, we have created innovation centers uh, to incubate and accelerate ideas and disrupt our business, uh, learning to uh, uh, fail fast as, as the startups are doing and, and, and that's a, a big evolution also. Uh, we have created uh, many partnerships also with innovative companies and institutions uh, which uh, either complement or even compete uh, with our current portfolio or, or innovation programs. Uh, here in the UAE we are very proud as far as uh, space is, is concerned to, to be a, a partner or associated with the UAE Space Agency uh, in the new space innovation program, uh, uh, mentoring startups. Uh, we're also involved with Hub 71 or also with the Mohammed bin Rashid Space Center, uh, to name a, a few examples. Uh, and we have also one additional string uh, that, that we can play is, is uh, uh, the possibility of uh, pure direct investment into new space companies. Uh, we have a, a, an Airbus venture arm, uh, which is our independent uh, venture capital capability on one of the, the six portfolio areas they are looking at is, uh, is new space. And uh, they have done some, um, some uh, seed investments already, for example, in uh, uh, Infostella, which is a ground segment as a service startup, uh, Leo Labs, uh, uh, space mapping startup. And another one, for example, is uh, Astrocast in partnership with uh, uh, ESA and also with Yasat, uh, which is basically developing a, a nano uh, satellite IoT network. I think it's uh, more than 60 satellites. So uh, the balance, the adaptation, and uh, it's a great opportunity for us uh, actors, uh, legacy actors, to associate ourselves by a partnership with these new space actors and make sure that we build together the future of the industry.
Thank you, Gregory. Um, George, without wanting to get into the, the global expansion of US companies um, too much in detail, but as kind of a representative of uh, emerging space companies that are increasingly looking to, to go global and, and participate in, in different markets, um, what kind of uh, things do you see that make new locations and, and new economies attractive to companies like yours when they're considering jumping into to global expansion? Well, you know, as I was um, talking about earlier, Ben, I think um, having that uh, solid regulatory foundation is really important because it can take a few years to get in place. And so I think, you know, the UAE strategy of sort of building from that while pursuing uh, technical uh, development in other areas was a very smart um, move. So certainly regulatory framework is, is important. I mean, vis-a-vis -vis our own expansion, you know, we're excited about the, the prospect of potentially someday expanding outside of the United States. Um, we've we've uh, made no secret of our excitement about potentially doing something out Alain in the UAE at some point. And um, uh, there's a fantastic set of facilities there. And I think, you know, um, as with any, uh, probably no, no big, um, secret you know we're looking for markets you know places where people are you know excited to fly from and excited to utilize the excitement around space to to catalyze uh economic development and 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 all that so you know i mean i think what an exciting time that we live in you know we we we're going to go from a period of time where only a few hundred of people had ever been to space mostly through government programs to a time when hopefully thousands of people will have been to space um because of their own, uh, you know, initiative, or because of research programs, you know, one of the very exciting things that we're doing is is flying uh, these research payloads, and I think soon we'll start flying uh, researchers as well, and and um, you know, all of those things are going to expand the number of people who are connected to space, who've experienced space, and uh, to be able to do that from a variety of different countries is tremendously exciting to us because you know it's really recapitulating in some way the early days of the aviation industry where you know, you had this technology and then it, and then it um, you know, grew around the, the planet to the benefit of all. That's a very exciting moment. And I think that, you know, the next 10 years is going to be a really exciting time for, uh, for, that, for, the, for that reason and, and many others. Thank you, George. We look, we look forward to that. Um, uh, perhaps just to, to make it a little bit more uh, uh, current in terms of talking, so talking about what's going to happen next in the future, 2020 has been a roller coaster year on, on so many levels. Talal touched briefly on you know, the role that G42 is playing in, in pandemics and vaccines. Uh, I'd be really interested if, if all of the panelists could kind of give us a, uh, a quick sense of, do you think that, that what's happened this year has, has reshaped the future of the space economy? Like, are we going to see long-term impacts um, from pandemics and, and, and economic uh, uncertainties that we've seen this year? Um, or do you think that this has actually been an opportunity for the space sector and the new space economy to, to demonstrate its value and, and to fill certain gaps? So maybe Luigi, you can kick off. Um, well, in, in my case, I'm going to uh, lean on the uh, not very positive for the sector. <laughs> I mean, for sure, there, is also, there, are, there are also opportunities attached uh, to the crisis, as always, and there are some uh, specific domains that are uh, better positioned, I mean, some uh, specific space domain that are better positioned than others to emerge uh, in a positive way out of the crisis. But in general, I mean, I think the, the main, uh, let's say, effect on the space sector from the crisis is the knock-on economic effect from uh, the impacts on other sectors. So since uh, uh, indeed government spending is still uh, substantial and it's still uh, uh, very important to drive the space sector forward, uh, even if the space sector per se is not that touched by the, the crisis as compared to other, uh, to other sectors, we can already see uh, signs of uh, spending, government spending being reduced as a result of the crisis in order to accommodate the need to uh, provide stimulus in other sectors. So uh, I think this is uh, in the medium term, uh, not, not positive for, uh, for the space sector. Uh, and uh, but yeah, there's 
not much uh, we can do from that uh, point of view. Then, uh, as I said, indeed, in, uh, if we go into the specifics for, uh, for some uh, specific domains, uh, opportunities are there due to the pandemics. So you can imagine opportunities in data and connectivity and, uh, and new type of applications being developed as a result of this. But overall, uh, um, I mean, I would tend to say that the crisis was not a good thing <laughs> for, uh, for space. Dimitri, do you see opportunity or do you see, uh, are, you as, are you as pessimistic as Luigi? Uh, you know, Ben, uh, Luigi is, is a pragmatic. He is counting his thinking figures as a romantic. I would say that, uh, <laughs> Luigi, nothing personal. I know you're romantic too. But uh, this year has been tremendous for a space industry. More and more people are willing to leave this planet. So I think it's, uh, uh, it's, it's very beneficial for space tourism for the uh, commercial space stations. Today, more countries express their interest in, in launching their own space station, the coming future space hotels. I think we, we just need to use this opportunity to, to send more, more people into space because the situation here on Earth is getting unpredictable sometimes. Uh, but uh, the, the things are changing. Even in, in Russia, just several days ago, a private Russian company was allowed to take part in the tender, for, tender procedure for a methane-powered rocket with a reusable uh, first stage. Uh, and uh, despite the fact that, that, that a traditional uh, manufacturer has won this, uh, this tender, uh, Samara Progress plant, but this, this is still a good example. Uh, from the re rest restrictionary point of view, there are certain rules, uh, certain procedures that, that do not allow broad foreign investment to come in, into the country. Like in the US, there is a CFIUS, uh, the, the committee uh, in Russia, we also have a committee on foreign investment. And uh, I'm, I'm pretty sure if, if not for these rules, maybe we could find an anchor investor for OneWeb, for example, in Russia this, this year. So there are still some, some obstacles for that. But once again, going back, uh, I think those uh, who are diving into this space business, they're more romantics rather than uh, cold-minded businessmen. And, and this is also, this, this is very good. I mean, it's really an exciting time. And I agree with George. Dimitri, we always appreciate a romantic. Um, Adnan, um, from your perspective, uh, how, how are you seeing it? Are you finding it easier to get? Is there less cues for a launch manifest? Are you uh, making things easier? Um, or has it, has it really not been such an impact for you sitting in the, the government space? Well, definitely, uh, you know, the pandemic uh, has an impact uh, on all levels, whether it's the government or private sector, whether it's space or other sectors, they were all impacted. Uh, in terms of the economy, yes, uh, because the space sector in general, uh, you know, faced a tough time. Uh, the business models that were not solid, uh, that were not uh, sustainable, uh, they didn't, didn't manage to go through with the pandemic. Uh, those who build their solid business model, uh, they continue working in the space, also in the other sectors. Uh, when it comes for us, actually, uh, this pandemic, uh, we came up with a lot of uh, lessons learned uh, in the way that we utilize our resources, uh, in the way that we operate uh, our missions. In fact, we have uh, more time, in fact, to uh, look into other opportunities and other projects. Uh, we managed to optimize things. Uh, our engineers, our team uh, has more time into looking into introducing new projects, new missions, and develop themselves. Um, during the pandemic also, uh, we had to launch our Mars mission. And uh, our launch window was a one month in, in, in mid of July till mid of August. Uh, so uh, we had to work differently uh, to make sure that uh, we launch on time and we managed to do that. Uh, although we had teams uh, in the UAE, in Japan, and in the States, uh, but at the end of the day, we managed to launch uh, our mission in the middle of the pandemic uh, on time and successfully. So there are a lot of uh, lessons learned, a lot of positive and negative. Uh, and, uh, you know, there are things that uh, we should learn from this pandemic is that uh, uh, you're going to face challenges, pandemic or economic uh, economical challenges or, or technical challenges, those are challenges you have to always think uh, outside the box uh, and find ways to overcome those challenges and continue uh, uh, in your path. 
Thank you, Adnan. Oh, I think that's a very good note to end on. Um, I think the new space economy is going to be continuing about being overcoming uh, new challenges that we haven't discovered yet. But I certainly think it's an area where we continue to see uh, excitement and growth and, and nowhere, nowhere more so than, than within the UAE. Uh, gentlemen, thank you so much for your time. To our audience, I uh, hope you found this uh, panel stimulating and food for thoughts. Um, and once again, thank you to the Global Aerospace Summit uh, for doing such a sterling job uh, in challenging times. And we look forward to seeing you uh, at another panel or uh, in person at a physical event uh, later this week. Thanks so much. Thank you. Thank you.